SpaceX's new and improved Super Heavy prototype, Booster 9, has begun its pre-launch tests at Starbase. The booster underwent a cryogenic proof test on its transport stand on Wednesday, December 21. Liquid nitrogen loading into the oxygen tank of the booster began at 10.26 a.m. on Wednesday, and it was filled to roughly 40% of its capacity in 40 minutes. After holding in that state for about 20 minutes, liquid nitrogen was drained from the oxygen tank. After almost completely detanking the oxygen tank, liquid nitrogen filling into the methane tank began, and it took SpaceX an hour to fill the methane tank to roughly 80% of its maximum capacity. After keeping the tank filled for about 25 minutes, SpaceX began draining the tank, concluding the first cryo-proof test of Booster 9. The test provides engineers with the data they need to determine whether the rocket can endure internal stresses and whether the structure has any leaks. During the oxygen tank proof test, a considerable amount of venting was observed from the orbital launch mount, indicating the launch pad was also tested on that day. SpaceX might have tested the reliability of the pad's plumbing after the recent repairs and upgrades. Road closures suggest rocket testing at Starbase will resume on Thursday, December 29. Starship 24 conducted its third static fire test on December 15, and in my previous update, I forgot to mention something significant that happened during the test. Although the single-engine static fire test on December 15 appeared to go off without a hitch, many thermal protection tiles did fall from the aft end of the ship during engine firing. Ship 24's aft end had a number of tiles removed by SpaceX last month to reinforce the stainless steel structure of the spacecraft. The fact that the tiles fell from where the repairs were made indicates that there was something wrong with the tile replacement after the repairs. In this video shared on Twitter by Felix Schlang, you can see the state of the tiles following the static fire test. It appears that numerous tiles sustained damage at various locations during the test. Teams have already started replacing the damaged thermal tiles on the ship with new ones, and some work is currently going on under the ship, hidden from the public eye. Maybe SpaceX is fixing some issues with the ship's Raptor engines. A new batch of second-generation Raptor engines was delivered to Starbase lately. The engines have an electric thrust vector control system, unlike the hydraulic system used by previous Raptor engines. The electric thrust vector control system features simpler hardware and will make it much easier to control the engine while in flight. According to Elon Musk, the system would save over a ton of hydraulic mass on the booster. The electric thrust vector control actuator on the engines resembles the actuator that moves the joints in Tesla AI bots. Tesla has already showcased the strength of its actuator technology by having a single leg actuator of the robot lift an entire piano. It appears that SpaceX is modifying existing Tesla technology and integrating it into the Starship. This isn't the first time SpaceX has incorporated Tesla technology into Starships. The battery packs used to power the actuators that move the fins of Starships are derived from Tesla. Repairs to the Starship orbital launch pad, which was damaged during the Booster 7 static fire test last month, are ongoing. This aerial photograph taken by RGV Aerial Photography shows that the concrete under the orbital launch mount has recently been fully removed. A ring can be seen in the center of the floor, probably the foundation for a flame diverter. The flame diverter will divert the exhaust plume away from the launch vehicle, preventing damage to the booster and the pad beneath it. A brand new heat exchanger was delivered to Starbase on December 19. It is a shell and tube type heat exchanger designed to subcool propellants below their boiling point. The heat exchanger consists of metal tubes passing through another metal enclosure, referred to as the shell. Two fluids with different starting temperatures flow through the heat exchanger. One flows through the tubes, and the other flows outside the tubes, but inside the shell. Heat is transferred from one fluid to the other through the tube walls. At Starbase, SpaceX has several such heat exchangers installed to sub-cool methane and oxygen before pumping them into the rocket. The newly delivered heat exchanger will increase the cooling capacity of the tank farm and help load propellant faster. Delivery of more such heat exchangers can be expected in the coming days, and they will be installed in the empty slots made for them in the tank farm. SpaceX continues to upgrade the berm wall that separates the launch pad and the tank farm. The upper level extension is almost complete, and another addition is being built at the base of the wall. SpaceX recently reconfigured the crane used to stack Starship launch tower sections at Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39A. The crane is now much shorter with fewer joints, which allows it to pick up heavier things. The main items it can lift at this height are the launch tower rocket catching and stacking arms, the Starship Quick Disconnect Arm, and the orbital launch mount table. The tower arms and Starship Quick Disconnect Arm are currently at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility, and the launch mount table is inside SpaceX's Hangar M at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station.
we will soon see those items being installed at Pad 39A. Now, let's discuss some of the major science and technology updates from the past week. The second mission of Europe's new Vega C rocket failed to reach orbit after its second stage malfunctioned. The Vega C rocket lifted off from French Guiana on December 20, carrying the Pleiades NEO 5 and Pleiades NEO 6 imaging satellites for Airbus. The liftoff took place on schedule, and the rocket's solid fuel first stage, designated P120C, did its job as planned. However, on screen telemetry showed that the rocket was deviating from its planned trajectory within four minutes of liftoff during the burn of the rocket's solid fuel second stage, named Zephyro 40. The flight continued for several minutes, during which the second stage separated, the third stage ignited, the payload fairing separated, and the stage achieved an apogee of 110 kilometers before beginning to descend. Ariane Space said in a later statement that the second stage suffered a drop in pressure after its ignition, prompting engineers to transmit a destruction command and send the launcher and its payload safely into the Atlantic. Uh, and under pressure has been observed on the Zephyro 40, which is the second stage of the Vega. And after this under pressure, we have observed the deviation of the trajectory and a very strong anomaly. So uh, unfortunately, uh, we can uh, say that the mission is uh, lost. The 35-meter-tall four-stage Vega C rocket, developed by the European Space Agency and operated by Ariane Space, is a more powerful version of the Vega rocket, which made its first flight in 2012. Vega C can carry about 2,230 kilograms of payload into a 700-kilometer sun-synchronous orbit, compared to 1,430 kilograms for the Vega rocket. Tuesday's mission was the first commercial launch of the Vega C in its second overall mission. In July, during its first mission, Vega C successfully lofted the Italian Space Agency's Layers 2 satellite, designed for the study of the Earth's gravitational field, as well as six ride-along CubeSats into orbit. The two satellites lost on Tuesday's mission were headed to a 700 km sun-synchronous orbit, where they would have completed Airbus's Pleiades Neo-Earth imaging constellation. Ariane Space and ESA have appointed an independent inquiry commission to determine the reasons for the failure. Vega C can't be expected to resume flight until the inquiry's findings are delivered and the necessary corrective action has been taken. After more than four years of collecting unique science on Mars, NASA's InSight lander has fallen silent on the Red Planet. InSight, short for Interior Exploration Using Seismic Investigations, Geodesy, and Heat Transport, landed on the Red Planet in 2018 and was the first spacecraft to document a Marsquake. The spacecraft was designed to understand the formation and evolution of Mars and determine the level of tectonic activity on the planet. Its highly sensitive seismometer had detected more than 1,300 Marsquakes, including several caused by meteoroid strikes. The way the Marsquakes traveled underground allowed researchers to measure the size of Mars core and the thicknesses of the other layers atop it. Meanwhile, the heat probe, nicknamed the Mole, was unsuccessful in penetrating the Martian soil, despite engineers' best efforts over a two year period. The mole was designed to dig 5 meters below ground, but could not do so due to the unusually clumpy soil. In the end, the instrument buried its 40-centimeter probe just barely below the surface, gathering important information about the temperature and physical characteristics of the Martian soil. Throughout its mission, InSight relied on solar power, but as the solar panels accumulated dust, the power levels of the spacecraft decreased. Usually, spacecraft on Mars are periodically dusted off by gusts of wind, but the region where InSight landed has been surprisingly calm. InSight last made contact with Earth on December 15. After two consecutive failed attempts to contact a lander, NASA declared on December 21 that the lander was retired. Despite only being intended to last 709 souls on the Red Planet, InSight managed to survive 1,440 Martian days. NASA will continue to listen for a signal from the lander, just in case, but hearing from it at this point is considered unlikely. South Korea's Denuri probe, also known as the Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter, has reached its destination after a four-month voyage. Denuri, meaning enjoy the moon, launched on 4 August atop a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, is Korea's first exploratory space mission outside of Earth's orbit. The successful launch put Denuri into a ballistic lunar transfer orbit, which took the probe on a 134-day long fuel-efficient voyage through space. The spacecraft entered the lunar orbit on December 16, after conducting its first lunar orbit insertion maneuver. With a perigee of 109 km and an apogee of 8,920 km, the orbiter is currently revolving around the moon every 12.3 hours. By December 28, the spacecraft will do four more propulsive maneuvers to steer it into a circular low-altitude orbit about 100 kilometers from the lunar surface. 
The 678 kg Denuri spacecraft has a cubic shape with two solar panels and a parabolic antenna mounted on a boom. The orbiter is equipped with two indigenously built cameras. The lunar terrain imager will image the moon's surface at a higher resolution of 2.5 meters per pixel. A wide-angle polarimetric camera, on the other hand, can determine the type of surface material based on how light reflects and scatters off it. Denuri also has a gamma-ray spectrometer, which will analyze highly energetic gamma rays emitted by the moon. This will help to determine the lunar surface's elemental makeup. The last of Denuri's indigenous instruments is a magnetometer. The moon lost its global magnetic field well over 3 billion years ago, but it does have local areas that are still magnetic. By measuring the weak magnetic fields from orbit, Denuri will help researchers understand the extent of protection they offer from harmful space radiation. Shadow Cam, Denuri's final instrument, is a NASA-supplied ultra-sensitive camera that can see inside permanently shadowed areas on the moon. It will provide critical information about the terrain and water in such areas. Data collected by Denuri during its year-long mission will allow researchers to take measurements of the lunar surface and identify potential landing sites for future missions. South Korea plans to land a robotic spacecraft on the moon in 2032 and on Mars in 2045. Since it landed on the Red Planet in February 2021, NASA's Perseverance rover has been collecting dust, rocks, and even air samples. While the rover analyzes many of these itself, some samples are stored away in titanium tubes for a future mission, called the Mars Sample Return Campaign. Based on the architecture of the campaign, the rover would deliver samples to a future robotic lander. The lander would use a robotic arm to place the samples in a containment capsule aboard a small rocket that would blast off into Mars orbit, where another spacecraft would capture the sample container and return it safely to Earth. But there's also a backup plan in case something goes wrong with Perseverance before the sample return lander gets there. The rover will drop 10 titanium tubes of samples at a location called Three Forks for future collection by two sample recovery helicopters. Perseverance dropped its first cache of precious rock samples on the sands of Mars on December 21. The sample, roughly the size of a piece of chalk, was taken on January 31 in the South Seta area of Mars Jezero Crater. The rover currently has the other 17 samples taken so far in its belly. The samples will reveal more about Martian geology and climate, and aid in the hunt for traces of ancient microbial life. On January 6, Perseverance will end its formal primary mission, having spent a full Martian year, or 687 days, on the Red Planet. It will then begin its extended mission, which involves investigating the upper reaches of the ancient river delta, responsible for bringing water, rocks, and sediments into Jezero Crater billions of years ago. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.